All right, so uh, first of all, thanks very much to Steve and the rest of the organizers for, for the invitation. Um, and today I'll present some recent work on um, constraining neural networks. I'm okay. not convinced it's on. Oh, okay. There it is. All right, we got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Fun. Thanks. All right, on constraining neural networks, which is, I guess is a, a topic of interest uh, for many of us. Uh, let it be constraining a neural network to return predictions that satisfy, let's say, conservation of mass or any, any other sort of constraints. Um, and this project is part of a, of a DARPA current effort. There's a, a current DARPA program named the Physics of Artificial Intelligence, where mainly the concept is to think of ways of introducing physics in, in deep learning uh, and constraining deep learning algorithms to, to respect physics in one form <coughs> or the other. And there's two main school of thoughts that have emerged through this program. Essentially, the first school of thought says that physics could be implicitly baked in in neural architectures with strong inductive biases by essentially um, revisiting the, the task of designing a neural network architecture to implicitly respect any invariance with respect to group symmetries and so forth. Uh, for instance, there's a recent work by Risi Condor uh, and his collaborators on covariant compositional networks for, lear for learning on graphs, which essentially uh, respect and are covariant to the, to the um, rotation invariances and, and permutation invariances uh, found in many body systems. Um, so this approach essentially will implicitly bake in the physics and it's guaranteed to, retur to return predictions that satisfy the, uh, the target properties at the expense of uh, implementation complexity and perhaps runtime. Then there is the easier way out where the physics is explicitly imposed by soft constraints uh, to the output of, imposed to the output of conventional neural architecture. So just fully connected networks or convolutional neural networks. So in general, neural architectures with weak inductive biases, which are constrained to satisfy the physics by uh, imposing soft penalties in their loss function during training. So essentially now you have some term in your loss function that is encouraging a data fit, but you will have some sort of regularizer or some additional loss, part of the loss, that is trying to uh, explicitly impose that, this regularization. So to this end, the f today's talk will be focused along the second school of thought here. And uh, we'll, we will um, specifically study the case of what we call physics-informed neural networks. So these are neural networks that have the goal of representing solutions to partial differential equations. Uh, so essentially, we will be dealing with general partial differential equations of this form, subject to some appropriate boundary or initial conditions. And we will make the choice of uh, using a neural network to represent the solution to that equation. So essentially, in some sense, we're not going to be using um, predefined features like uh, you know, Legendre polynomials. So we'll sort of accept the trade-off of sacrificing maybe uh, theoretical rigors to representational flexibility and, and scalability in computation. So now, the first thing we can recognize is that that choice of representing the solution to PDE with a neural network, we have a representation that is fully differentiable with respect to the inputs of, of the neural net, which could be space coordinates, time coordinates, or any other parameters. So we can take gradients of the output with respect to those inputs and essentially form any sort of residual operators that try to, um, to explicitly impose uh, the PDE residual to be zero inside of our domain of interest or to satisfy the initial or boundary conditions. And this is not a new idea. The idea of using neural networks to solve PDEs it actually goes back to the original work of uh, Psychojos and Ungar and then Lagaris in the late 90s. What is different now is that those guys back then, they did not have access to automatic differentiation uh, software. So they had to sit down and manually derive what those activation functions are after the application of the differential operators and even more tediously derive manually all the backpropagation rules to, to train the networks. So keep in mind here there is no data. We're trying to, to train a neural net with very minimal amounts of data. The only data we have here is perhaps data the initial condition or the boundary condition of our domain, but we want to predict the solution inside the domain, which essentially we're requiring our network to extrapolate. Why can it extrapolate? Well, because we're, we're imposing in a soft manner those physics constraints. So that is what will... Uh, uh, enable us to extrapolate and reconstruct the solution at any given location in space or time. So these ideas have revived, have been revived in the f last few years uh, by several uh, works that have pursued 
um, this topic, and then Mazia in the next talk, I'm sure she will uh, give you a very nice overview and a collection of applications of this framework to different problems. Uh, but since uh, I have the first talk, and maybe some of you is the first time who, that see f physics from neural networks, let me just demonstrate how they work through a very, very simple example. All right, so let's take, for instance, the Berger's equation that you all know in one dimension with some small vis viscosity term subject to initial and boundary conditions. And essentially now we can use neural nets to solve this equation in maybe 30 lines of code in Python or 50 lines of code. All we need to do is to define uh, the forward pass of a neural network that takes as input space and time coordinates and predicts the solution u. And then just use the automatic differentiation capabilities of TensorFlow to construct the residual of that equation. And now essentially we can train this neural network by formulating an appropriate loss function to do so. And that loss function will have a composite form, it will have two terms. The first term will try to encourage the neural network to fit the observed data we have for the initial and boundary conditions. And then the second term will try to minimize the residual of that equation so that you see down here, this is this equation. Uh, we'll try to minimize that residual at a set of collocation points that the user is free to select uh, anywhere in the domain. How many of those collocation points? Well, in principle, infinitely many of them, because at every mini batch of training, we can just randomly sample and generate collocation points anywhere we want in the domain. So this essentially could be an infinite number of points, which is not formal training data that we have observed, but this is sort of artificial collocation points that we generate during the training of the network. And this is how uh, the solution of this problem would look like. Do you have some data that is scattered at the boundaries of this domain? You have the x time going s goes to this direction, the space um, coordinate is in the vertical axis. This is the training data, and that would be the reconstructed solution after the neural network has been trained jointly on this training data plus the collocation points. Uh, these are some slices, how the solution looks like at different times. And that's a sort of a deceptively simple problem, as many of you know, it, in order to resolve this um, a solution using conventional numerical methods, one has to be really, really careful in how uh, you discretize uh, the domain and what numerical method you're choosing. Here, all, that, all those things don't really matter, and then you just feed this problem uh, into a GPU, and 60 seconds later, you get the solution. Um, all right, so, of course, this is along the lines of using neural nets to solve PDs, but as a framework, physics in form neural networks is quite flexible. So you can operate in, in this domain here where you may know the equation precisely and you have a small amount of data corresponding to boundary conditions. So now the goal is to reconstruct the solution. But you could be op operating in different regimes. For instance, some really interesting regimes is where you are you have some intuition about your physics, but maybe you're missing a closure term or you have unknown parameters, but you have a little bit more data and now you can still use the same framework to reconstruct the solution, but also infer the unknown parameters, or even the big data resume where you may not know any of the physics and you're trying to recover mechanistic models directly from data. Uh, so this is just a collection of different applications that essentially they're variants of, of the framework of uh, physics from your networks, and I'm sure Mazia in the next talk will actually give you a lot more details on some of these applications that span um, different regimes, for instance, for discovery of dynamical system, discovery of PDE models, solving high dimensional PDEs using these techniques, or even stochastic PDEs. So this is just a recap, because the focus of this talk is um, revisiting this concept of constraining neural nets to satisfy physics by imposing soft constraints in their loss function. And despite some interesting early results on, on doing so, um, you know, failure looms even in for the simplest problem. So, for instance, take the simple Poisson equation, um, and I even fabricate an exact solution that depends on those two parameters, A1 and A2. Now, for a simple choice of A1 and A2 that introduce some directional isotropy to this problem, you get a solution that perhaps looks like this. You try to fit this with a physics-informed neural network. No matter how much you try and whatever tricks you do, it's very likely that you will get a solution that looks like this. And this is just a representative realization. You have 59% error in, in your prediction. So what's, going, what's really going on here? Um, what is really going on is that this, uh, this framework and this technique cannot really be applied as a black box. And what we really need to do is to take a step back and rethink how we set up those models, because those models introduce an unconventional regularizer. So typically you're used in regularizing the parameters of your neural net, so that would be some L2 norm over the parameters, or L1 norm, but here in this case, this is an actual uh, constraint 
over the function space that the network represents. This is not just a norm, an L2 norm of your parameter theta, but it's a constraint on the output of the neural net. And that is an unconventional regularizer, or prior if you wish, that requires us to revisit standard deep learning practices. So all of those things will matter a lot when we're trying to set up a problem like this. For instance, what is the loss function we're using? Uh, here, in the previous examples, I was using the square residual, but other options are available. What, how do you initialize those networks? How do you normalize your data? Or what the small amount of data you have? Um, how do you optimize those networks? Or what would be a right network architecture that perhaps would be more resilient to such pathologies? And that brings us to the topic of this talk, which essentially were, um, the goal is to identify some modes of failure of physics-informed neural networks. One of those modes of failure is related to gradient pathologies during model training. And then we'll try to overcome it, or at least uh, mitigate those pathologies through looking at the optimization problem and try to come up with some uh, learning rate annealing strategies or tweaking the architecture to make things a little bit more resilient to that. Uh, by, uh, you know, um, by the way, if there's any questions at any point, feel free to interrupt and ask me. All right, so essentially, Again, the loss function of physics of neural networks has a composite form. It, have some, it has some term that was trying to fit the observed data. It has a term that's trying to minimize the residual of the PDE. Perhaps has another term that tries to fit the initial conditions or the boundary conditions. And then the hypothesis here is that such constraints will alter the, lo the, the loss landscape of, of, the, of, of our neural net. And different terms in these composite loss functions may have different nature and different magnitudes, potentially leading to imbalanced gradients during backpropagation, during model training. So and what do I mean during model training? Well, you all know that the gradients are very important because the parameters of those neural nets will be updated using gradient descent. And now any imbalance in those gradient terms we may, which we might make one of those terms dominate over the other ones, which means that we may be able, for instance, to minimize the residual, but we may not be able to fit the boundary conditions of our problem. Therefore, the solution may not be unique or may not be accurate. And that's sort of exactly what, what is happening in this uh, toy problem that I just showed you. It turns out that the a physics informed neural network that's trying to approximate the solution to this problem, it will have a loss function that is trying to minimize the PD residual and the boundary conditions for this uh, elliptic problem, but it will have a really hard time fitting the boundary conditions term. And you all know that for a Poisson equation, if you don't get the boundary conditions right, you cannot really expect any, yeah. The kind of engineering solution that people do when they build these crazy things, you just put in, you put in parameters in there, and then you, exactly. you, you keep tweaking the parameters. Yeah, until that's where we're heading to. Right. That's where we're heading to. <laughs> yeah, exactly, so <laughs> you're giving away the story, but this is uh, exactly what, 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 what we'll try to do. And now the question is how do you choose those parameters or, or adjust them? Okay, and then this is sort of a pictorial um, intuition of how I think of this problem or what is maybe going wrong. So just consider the case of minimizing this additive loss where the two components of this loss, F1 and F2, um, you know, have different scales. So perhaps F1 is the, the smooth blue curve you see in the background, it's just a sine wave, and F2 could be some small noise perturbation. Now if you're trying to minimize this using plain gradient descent, starting from some initial condition where is this star point here, you're going to converge to the first local minimum, whereas the, uh, this is this Magellan point. Um, and then on the right plot, you just see the gradients of, of F1 and F2 with respect to X. So obviously, gradient descent is bound to get trapped in local and suboptimal minima. And now the question is, or the hypothesis, is could we adjust the weights in this loss, or equivalently, can we uh, come up with a strategy of selecting different learning rates, so essentially decompose this gradient descent update uh, into this one in, in a way that uh, will actually converge to a better solution by choosing what those learning rates are, and those could be adaptive, so that means they, you know, those learning rates could change during the optimization. All right, so let's um, set up a benchmark problem that we'll use throughout the talk to compare different approaches, and that would be the 2D Helpholz problem um, with some parameter k equals to 10 and an exact solution that is fabricated. So essentially, if I take the original formulation of physics of neural networks and throw, it, th throw this problem to it, I will have a loss function that will try to fit the boundary conditions of the Helmholtz equation, plus another loss function that will try to minimize the residual inside the, the square domain. That would be the exact solution. This is the prediction of a trained neural net and has about 10% relative error. But what is interesting here is that I can go ahead 
and visualize during model training, I can go inside every of the hidden layers in this four layer deep network and visualize the histograms of the gradients corresponding to each term in this loss function. So I can actually compute and visualize the histograms of uh, the gradients with the, of the boundary loss term with respect to the neural net parameters and the gradients of the residual loss term with respect to the neural net parameters. Um, and let's say somewhere halfway through my optimization, that would be a representative picture of what happens. So what you see here is that the gradients with respect to the boundary uh, conditions term, they all collapse around zero. So most of those gradients are, are taking zero values. Uh, while the gradients corresponding to the residual term, they have positive values. So essentially what the neural net is doing is through this loss function, the residual term is really dominating the optimization problem. The neural net is trying to fit a zero residual inside the domain, but it's, ha it ha it's having a hard time fitting the boundaries uh, because really there is no healthy gradient signals coming back from this boundary conditions term to tweak the neural net parameters such that the boundary conditions are, are satisfied. So going back to the last comment, the only thing we'll do here is to revisit this problem, but now introduce some weights in this loss function, weigh the two terms in a different way. So we have some parameters, lambda one and lambda two. So if we do so, there exists a magic combination of lambda one and lambda two that will actually reduce the error a lot more. And now you see, if you compare this to the previous plot, the, this is the absolute error between the exact and the predicted solution. Most of it comes from the domain boundaries with a scale of uh, 0.5. Now, this error is now vanished from the boundaries. There's a little bit of error inside the domain, but the scale is much, much smaller. All right, and now if you play the same game and you try to visualize, um, oops, the histograms of the gradients during backpropagation, you will get a more healthy picture, a more balanced picture. So now the question is, obviously, how do we choose those weights? Um, and I think there's three different approaches. One different approach is employ the so-called uh, gra uh, graduate student descent method. So you hire a graduate student, uh, you let them tweak things for a couple of weeks, and maybe they come up with a magic choice. Uh, approach number two is you talk to Ramit, who is an uh, expert in hyperparameter tuning and meta learning. So, you know, he will write a wrapper around your solver and perform an exhaustive hyperparameter search to tweak those parameters. And the third approach is what I want to uh, talk uh, today, which is um, perhaps a more, um, you know, we can engineer a way of selecting those weights during training, um, during runtime, the runtime of the algorithm. And that brings us to the next slide, which any of you that have trained the neural net yourself recently must be familiar with. So this is just um, some pseudocode for the Adam optimizer, all right? So the main ingredients behind the Adam optimizer is that it maintains a running average of the gradient statistics during training. So as you start training, you can compute the gradients at every layer and you can infer, uh, you know, you can infer the, the first moment of the gradients as you train by this running average and you can infer the second moments of your gradients as you train. And now you're gonna use this information to come up with a gradient update rule that adapts the learning rate for every single parameter of your network based on the history, based on those running averages of the gradients, all right? So the take home message of the Adam optimizer is to use the gradient statistics during training to adaptively adjust the rate, learning rate for every parameter in your network, all right? So this is essentially the main observation and the main trick we will employ to adjust those weights in our loss function, which essentially you can think of them uh, as tweaking the learning rate of our algorithm with respect to every different loss, so if, uh, every different term in the loss. So if I am to summarize everything in one algorithm, we will be considering loss functions of this form where I have separated the residual term on its own and now I have a summation over the other, the rest of the losses. So you could think of those losses um, uh, including the loss with respect to any measurements, initial or boundary conditions for our partial differential equation. And now the goal is to adjust those parameters lambda i. So initially I will, initial, I will select them to be one and then through my gradient descent optimizations, through the n iterations of my optimizer, I will compute those quantities here, lambda hat i, we have, which I have direct access to and I can compute them at no additional computational cost because anyway I have to compute the gradients of, of my loss. And essentially, I will adjust those lambda i's to be the ratio of the maximum value attained uh, by the gradient of the residual loss divided by the kth percentile 
of each corresponding loss, uh, let it be the measurement loss or the boundary conditions loss. And because this estimate will be very noisy, as I optimize with stochastic gradient descent, I will again update it using a moving average to, to obtain the first order statistics of this, of this lambda quantity. And then finally, I will use this lambda i weight to perform a gradient update step in this fashion. So now the learning, late, learning rate eta will be multiplied by the lambda i uh, correspondingly at every iteration of my algorithm to, to adjust it. So the goal of this algorithm is essentially balance the, um, the effect of every individual term in the loss function in terms of backpropagated gradients. All right? So any questions? Or right. so the, the difference between sort of starting with a fixed value that sort of sets the scale mm -hmm. absolutely, and then so if one loss term is really, really small, yeah. the, the network starts to ignore it. Yeah. Here it sounds like no matter how small a loss term mm -hmm. gets, you'll continually like upweight it, and it will look more and more important, so they're all yeah. balanced. Yeah, that's that's the goal in this in this setting. Yeah. That may not be what you want, right? If the residual is down at ten to the minus ten, and the boundaries at you know ten to the minus one, then you don't want it. Well, you still you want the boundary to, to yeah you want to keep those things balanced during the optimization. Um, that wouldn't be the case if your data is noisy, right? Now that such a scheme may encourage overfitting, and and, and then, yeah. So in that case, it may not be the optimal uh, thing to do. But if your data is noiseless and you, you know that the boundaries are exact and that's exactly what you want to fit, yeah. this will try to balance things for you. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. OK, so though we can revisit the, um, the baseline example and now just run a systematic um, comparison between you know, the, the original approach that includes no um, reweighting of the different loss terms versus the algorithm that I just showed you. And you see a consistent improvement um, in, the, in the prediction error. So essentially, in many cases, you could get predictions error that errors that are up to 30%, whereas in this case, regardless of the architecture, you get uh, some consistent predictive performance. All right, so I think the main take home message that out of this talk is not really the annealing strategy, because I think there is still a lot of room to analyze and, and come up with better solutions. But the main take home message is that if you have a case where you're trying to constrain your neural network using soft constraints, uh, you need to reconsider all those uh, topics. You cannot really just take um, Keras or t TensorFlow just a, as a black box and, and throw the Adam optimizer and expect that things, that, that things would work. So you have to carefully revisit what's your loss. And here I showed you examples using the square residual. But you could think of uh, setting up a variational principle to minimize, use the Hamiltonian of your system. This, essentially, this would give you an entirely different loss landscape. Um, initializing the network, here we just use the standard Glorio initialization, but there could be different or better ways of doing so. And normalizing the data, which is really non-existent here, because we only have, mostly we have the residual data points, but perhaps if you have PDE solution bounds, you could use them to sort of rescale the problem and, and normalize it. Uh, the optimizer, you could think of adaptive learning rates or even different gradient descent strategies, such as proximal algorithms or, or hyperparameter uh, tuning. And lastly, the network architecture. And I'll show, you, I'll show you in the next slide a very simple adaptation to the network architecture that turned out to be uniformly better than fully connected networks. Um, and, and, and this is what we came up with, which is inspired by uh, gated recurrent units. Um, essentially, the goal here was to introduce multiplicative interactions of the input. So essentially, we take a fully connected neural net, takes as input, let's say, space-time coordinates, and gives you as output the approximation to your PDE solution. And we added to that two auxiliary networks that just transform the input variables to those quantities u and v. And now we're using those quantities u and v to come up with the final prediction using these point-wise multiplications of the hidden layers in the main network uh, times u or v. So now this will explicitly account for multiplicative interactions across the inputs. And it's very similar to attention mechanisms using, uh, used in uh, computer vision or, or NLP, or uh, natural language processing models. And now the second uh, trick that um, goes into this is that we have these residual connections. So now these transformed inputs will be fed inside every single of the hidden layers. Uh, so that will also improve resilience against uh, vanishing gradient pathologies. Um, everything is now at the expense of introducing two more weight matrices and biases and a few more floating point uh, uh, operations during the forward pass of the network. So it's a minimal overhead, 
but it turns out to be um, significantly more resilient than a standard fully connected architecture. And this is sort of a summary if you actually, so model one is our baseline model, model two is a baseline with the adaptive learning rates, model three is the, um, the updated neural architecture without the adaptive learning rates, and model four is putting everything together, and you see a consistent improvement of the order of like 50 to 100 times improvement in predictive accuracy if you do so for the standard 2D Helmholtz equation benchmark. So now, of course, you may say, okay, um, that's just a standard benchmark and everything worked in this way. So part of our current work is to test this approach uh, across a wide range of problems. So um, another benchmark is a wave equation. So I'm just presenting some highlights results here. So this is the equation subject to boundary and initial conditions. That would be the prediction of a, of a standard physics informed neural networks with no, none of the uh, proposed tricks. And this is what we can get using the adaptive learning rates and the, um, the updated architecture. So we have a reduction to the error from 76% to 0.6%. That's another extension. That's a nonlinear problem similar to the wave equation, the Klein-Gordon equation. So similar behavior observed there. Uh, the original method seems to be doing a little bit better here. The, the prediction error was about 6.7% in the relative L2 norm. You can bring this down to 0.1. And one interesting problem is that for the first time, at least in my experience, because we've, uh, we've been trying to solve a fluids problem with this physics in neural nets for a while, this is the first time we actually got any meaningful prediction for the lead-driven cavity flow uh, in 2D, which is, of course, a toy problem if you're doing fluids. It's, it's a ridiculously simple problem. But uh, it turns not to be so simple for uh, solving with neural nets. And remember, here we're trying to solve a PD, right? We don't have any data. The only data we have is the boundary conditions for the flow. We're not using any simulated data out of a CFD solver to train the neural net. So we're, we're actually asking the neural net to predict the flow field without ever seeing any data from it. Um, Meaning finite volumes versus neural nets. Uh, it's like two orders of magnitude indifferent in favor of finite volumes, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But there is no, there is no real comparison. So here we just want to see whether it, the model can actually do it. But the main benefits of using neural nets is not really in the context of solving PDs. Uh, it's mainly in the one of the slides I showed earlier, where you may know the PD, but you're missing some parameters. You have some data. But why yeah. is it two orders? Why is it two orders? Well, you, you need. Training, training the network. Training the network. Yeah. Once you have trained it, you have trained it you, it's a blink of an eye to make predictions, right? The four, it's just a forward pass. So you train it, you do it once, right? That's, you do it once for a given boundary conditions and problem setup, you're right. Um, where the actual speed up could happen is, is if you're solving a parametric problem where you parameterize boundary conditions or you want to change the Reynolds number, then yes, you train it once, but then you hope that you can predict through the range of those parameters. Um, and then, yeah, sure, the neural net could be competitive in that setting. All right, and then finally, just a summary slide, just to say that function space, cons function space constraints in neural nets introduce an unconventional regularizer that requires to revisit standard deep learning practices. Uh, obviously, the constraints will alter the, the landscape of your loss function and uh, could cause pathologies such as imbalance gradients during backpropagation. Adaptive annealing of learning rates could be one way to, to resolve this if that's what you need for a given problem. Um, neural network architectures also play a, a big role in safeguarding against those pathologies, so it's worth spending time to, to think what the right architecture for your, your problem is. And using the proposed techniques, we're able to observe a consistent improvement in the predictive accuracy of physics-informed neural networks by a factor of 50 to 100 across a range of problems. And, but still, we're at the very early stages of really understanding what's going on when we're training and constraining uh, this kind of models. So with that, I would just like to acknowledge uh, Sifan, um, who's working with me on this, uh, DOE and DARPA for funding this work. And we're at the la la late stages of compiling a manuscripts that should appear on the archive uh, within the next few weeks. So thank you. Yeah.